The Wolf of Wall Street was downloaded illegally more than any other movie. Piracy, that's where Hollywood has a really big problem. Musicians have a problem, too. I don't want to talk about leaks. It freaks me out. America grants certain rights to creators of songs, books, movies, paintings. The idea is to encourage the creation and proliferation of new ideas by providing a brief and limited period of exclusivity. Even drug dealers understand the value of that. That's a brand name. Like Pepsi, that's a brand name. What do you want to I'm going to change the name on it. I would if he doesn't change the name, the lawyers may come. I'm an intellectual property attorney, and you have stolen my client's melody. You can be sued and found liable for monetary damages. And yet, some of you watch my show on YouTube. That's stealing. And that's our show tonight. And now, John Stossel. Ideas can change the world. For most of human history, people suffered in miserable poverty, mainly because no one had thought of better ways to do things. Then, suddenly, in just the last few hundred years, some new ideas made life better for billions. Things like running water, the printing press, the steam engine, electricity, now the internet. We want people to keep coming up with new ideas, but there's a problem. Why would you bother to spend years inventing something if other people could just steal your idea? They'd make the money, you might not. Let's say a guy invents a better light bulb. His price needs to cover not just the manufacturing cost, but also the cost of inventing the thing in the first place. Now let's say a competitor starts manufacturing a competing copy. The competitor doesn't need to cover those development costs, so his version can be cheaper. The bottom line, original creations can't compete with the price of copies. That's a video made by filmmaker Kirby Ferguson. If original creations can't compete with copies, inventors will invent fewer things. What could be done to address that unfair imbalance? In the United States, the introduction of copyrights and patents was intended to address this imbalance. Copyrights covered media, patents covered inventions. Both aim to encourage the creation and proliferation of new ideas by providing a brief and limited period of exclusivity, a period where no one else could copy your work. Brief? How, how brief? I wrote this book. How long until you can copy it? That time limit has changed over the years. First in 1831 from 28 years to 42 years, then again in 1909 to 56 years, in 1976 to the lifetime of the author plus 50 years, and in 1998 to the lifetime of the author plus 70 years. My lifetime plus 70 years? That seems long. And it's wrong, says David Kepsel. In fact, he says no one should be able to own an idea as property, and we should just get rid of all copyrights and patents. No, that's crazy, says Lauren Siskind, who's an intellectual property lawyer. And I assume most people agree with him. So, David, let's start with you. I mean, no copyright, no trademark. Why would I write this if you could just rip it off? Why did Shakespeare write all those plays he did before there was copyright? Why did he uh, profit through putting his name on plays that were actually retellings of old stories? Well, because they, you can make Lawrence, money. Lawrence, why? You know, Shakespeare did it without copyright. They may not have had a copyright statute at the time, but uh, people who pirated other people's plays were dealt with harshly. Uh, Shakespeare. How? He would go after these people, sometimes try to shut down the theater. There was copying, and it was wrong. That's another but if there was no law, how could he shut the theater down? John, you have so thugs far, go beat him up? You have phrased this solely in terms of utilitarianism. Why will people do something if they don't get rewarded? It's also a moral issue, John. Uh, someone who creates something has a moral right to uh, protect what he has created just as someone, just as a farmer, has a right to land that he has mixed his labor with. This is a natural rights issue, John. The rights that are natural are those that are founded in the nature of property being scarce. So when I hold something, it is to the exclusion of someone else. Ideas are not like that, and when we have laws that uh, allow me to monopolize the expression of an idea it necessarily inhibits somebody else's free expression. And right, that's, what, that's what, what about something that's both an idea and a physical thing like a, a new drug? It costs these drug companies 
a billion dollars to get it through government. If somebody could just copy it, they wouldn't do it. Pharmaceuticals are a special problem because there's a great deal of regulation already built up with the research and development of the drugs. You have to go through clinical trials. But we see in other fields like software, um, where the R&D costs are much lower and coming down all the time, uh, that people are actually opting out of the copyright and patent system. How do they make money? They make money by the strength of their name and by the strength of their product. They do it like other competitive products on the marketplace do, by making a good product and selling it and competing with other others as the free market is supposed to work. Well, it's not off, always clear how modern life could work without copyrights and trademarks, but there is at least one area of life where government does not enforce trademarks, illegal drugs. And yet, intellectual property still exists. In this gangster movie, Denzel Washington is upset that Cuba Gooding has watered down Denzel's dope, which is called Blue Magic. That's a brand name. Like Pepsi, that's a brand name. They know that even if they don't know me any more than they know the, the, the chairman of General Mills. When you chop my dope down, the one, two, three, four, five percent, and then you call it blue magic, that is trademark infringement. What do you want, Frank? You want me to change the name on it? I would have to insist that you change the name. Fine by me, Frank. I'll, uh, I'll call it red magic. So, David, is that how it's supposed to work? And he, he'll change... You'll persuade people? Yeah, look, if, if somebody wants to come along and copy Shakespeare's plays and market them as, as their own... Stossel. You, yes, St Stossel's Hamlet. Well, you've now got to, to deal with a couple of problems. One is the audience is going to know you didn't write it, you're ripping off Shakespeare, and you've, got, you've lost your bad reputation. But these reputational issues are, are work in the private market. You don't need a government to come in and, and enforce them. What about music? Uh, I, I often try to use music on this program, but sometimes I'm told, you can't use that, we don't have the right. Actor Nick Offerman did this parody of how the music copyright system works. But not every opinion is rendered Stop the audio, shut it down now. Why, who the hell are you? I'm an intellectual property attorney and you have stolen my client's melody. So Lawrence, that's, that's what you do? No, I... I um do that kind of thing in court, not in someone's workshop. To you, these laws are reasonable, clear enough for most people? Well, <clears throat> like all laws, uh, they require tailoring from time to time. Reasonable people can disagree, for example, on how long the term of a copyright should be. The rules are confusing, and they often open people up to lawsuits. Here's one example. In 1981, George Harrison lost a $1.5 million case for subconsciously copying the doo-wop hit He's So Fine in his ballad, My Sweet Lord. Subconsciously copying? Are you kidding me? You know, in that case, he admitted he had made a mistake and he tried to settle it before it went to trial. Uh, the tune was well known. Um, he said it was subconscious, but whether it was or wasn't, he did not have a right to use someone else's tune. The fact that he was a great creative uh, person in his own right didn't give him the right to infringe on other people's creative products. And how would they make money if anybody could just copy any song? They are making money through doing what uh, they've been doing for ages, uh, by doing performances. Uh, by uh, hoping that people will buy their products, and in fact they do. Uh, you know, I live in Mexico City, and I can walk out my door, go 200 yards, and buy a pirated copy of anything I want. Um, and yet, box office receipts in Mexico City go up every year. Why? Because the people who can afford to go to theaters, the people who can afford to buy the original products, choose to. You know, that's all well and good if you have a famous entertainer, say a Lady Gaga or Tony Bennett, but how does an entertainer become famous in the first place? The reason people will pay money to go and see one of their performances is because intellectual property law allowed them to become famous in the first place. Uh, David? I don't think that's necessarily true. You see a lot of independent performers now uh, making money uh, through uh, doing live gigs at smaller venues and then becoming famous there too. It's not always copyright law that enables that. Sometimes it's also making good music. Let's assume copyright protection is a good thing. What's not a good thing is that special interest groups then lobby politicians to tilt the law in their favor. And my former employer, Disney, did that. Even after making big bucks from stories like Pinocchio that they got for free. Stories like Snow White, Pinocchio, and Alice in Wonderland were all taken from the public domain. 
But when it came time for the copyright of Disney's early films to expire, they lobbied to have the term of copyright extended. Extended from 75 years to 95 years. Snow White, their first movie, would now be free to copy if they hadn't gotten their special deal. But now they control Snow White until the year 2032. Lawrence, that's not right. And I, I don't know that, I, you know, 70 years after my death, I should own this thing? They don't have the right to the story for 95 years. What they have a right to is their expression of it. The story of Snow White is an ancient German myth. And anybody, you and So I can David do a cartoon I, where she's singing and... You can do a story of any kind you want that involves a bitter queen, a mirror, a poison apple. Just as Leonard Did, Bernstein... Disney's not going to sue them? No, not for those basic elements. Just as Shakespeare, to get back to Shakespeare for a minute, could not have sued Leonard Bernstein and Stephen Sondheim for coming up with West Side Story, which is the same basic story as Romeo and Juliet. And, and you would argue that this is this big business cronyism scam to get it extended for so long. Yeah, and just because they're not necessarily going to win in court, it doesn't mean they're not going to use their, you know, full of lawyers, full of to, lawyers scare to scare people. Of course, that's exactly what happens, and that happens in the patent industry, too. Thank you, David. Lawrence, to join this debate, please follow me on Twitter at FBN Stossel and use that hashtag ideas or like my Facebook page so you can post on my wall. Coming up, how some magicians managed to protect their trade secrets without suing people. And what I do about people who rip me off. Welcome to 2020. I'm John Stossel. I'm John Stossel. Give me a break. You want a break? You're going to get a break. I'm going to give you a break right now. I'm going to kick this snubby little What if you're a magician and you come up with a cool new magic trick? You might patent your trick, but then the secret would be out there. So how does a magician protect his creative work? In a moment, I'll ask this magician. My name is Rick Lax. Welcome to Vertigo. Rick Lax invented this trick where a deck of cards seems to float in the air. Soon, someone in Russia showed the trick on the Internet and was trying to make money by selling the secret behind it. Rick Lax joins us now. So this Russian guy ripped you off? He sure did, and he made some money doing it. How do you make money? Uh, he charged people for this video that he made uh, explaining how to do my trick. So to protect his vertigo trick, Rick put on a disguise and made this fake exposure video, which claims his anti-gravity trick is done with tape. First thing, right there, you see that tape? Then at the end of this video, he takes off his disguise and explains that he was conning you. It's a secret to vertigo. You're not going to find it here. <sighs> no, you're not going to uh, find it here or really anywhere. Uh, on YouTube, I don't think. If you really want to learn uh, how to do it, you do have to get the uh, DVD. So you make, try to make some money selling DVDs, explaining it. That's right. And I made that video uh, not because I wanted to, but because I had to. Uh, over 50,000 people watched that video alone. My fake exposure video, where it started off, where if you're watching it, you're a magician, and you think you're going to get the secret for free. So you watch along the video, and you say, oh, is it done with tape? And it's not really done with tape. And then at the end, it's me, and you find out, oh, this really isn't how it's done. But I can see that there is a demand for these, fa for these exposure videos, because 50,000 people watched mine. And if right now, if you were to Google Rick Lax, how to do vertigo, you would find hundreds of videos with tens of thousands of hits. And some of them will be real exposure videos. Uh, those are videos where the magicians really tell you how it's done. And some of them will be fake ones, like the one you just saw. So why don't you try to go to government? Copyright, patent, some trademark something. and. Yeah, it's, Own it and sue people who do it. Oh, it's really hard for us magicians uh, to do that. If, if we want to patent uh, a magic trick, 
In some cases, we can. If there's a, a special device that lets us do the trick, we can take out a patent, but patents are publicly searchable, so everyone's going to know how it's done. So we don't like that. Here's a magician in a mask who reveals secrets behind magic tricks. Oh, this tricks jerk. And put all that right, on, all right, let's show TV. it. Great. One, two, three. Caresta. The scarves are gone. How did he do it? What you don't see is that the scarves are hooked to a short piece of fishing line. He had a whole TV show doing this, but you say that the community of magicians, without getting law involved, punished him. Yeah, we, uh, we exercised him from the community. He was a Vegas magician named Valentino, and you will not see him performing uh, anywhere big in America. He doesn't get as much work anymore? No, definitely not, because no one wants to associate with him. Once you share the secrets with the, uh, the layman, ah, we're nervous to share our secrets with you because we're afraid that you're going to turn around, share it with everyone else. So in some ways, you guys are like Coca-Cola. You have a trade secret that you don't want to write down for people to steal. You just want to keep it secret. And Coca-Cola has done that. Thomas's English Muffins, Kentucky Fried Chicken, WD-40, uh, Google search algorithm. None of this is legally registered anywhere. That's right. Uh, and the reason they don't legally register it is because patents and copyrights, uh, those only work for a limited period of time. Uh, but when you keep something a trade secret, you can keep it a trade secret for a hundred years. And Coca-Cola has done that. Some people allegedly did steal the secret and they went to Pepsi with it. Pepsi went to the FBI and told Coke. That's right. And, uh, and these people got punished. I don't know if they realized it going into it, but stealing a trade secret like that, uh, it is not just a civil infraction. This is now a federal crime. And uh, so they got in some real trouble for doing that. The rare magician who did copyright a routine was Teller of Penn and Teller. Uh, he has a trick where he cuts the shadow of a rose and somehow makes the actual rose petals fall. He registered this act with the U.S. Copyright Office 30 years ago. Recently, someone in Belgium posted a video of that trick that he called the Rose and Her Shadow. I don't know if he grabbed it from the Copyright Office, but he offered to reveal the secret behind it for $3,000. Teller sued him, and as you said, last year he won $15,000. So that's a reason to copyright. Yeah, except for right now, uh, Teller might be the exception rather than the rule. Because even in the ruling, the judge said, I'm going to give this one to you, but so you know, you can't really copyright a magic trick. I'm only going to give it to you because the choreography surrounding the trick, that you can have a copyright on, the, the pantomime that accompanies the trick. Uh, so now us magicians, we're trying to figure out how broad is this ruling? Is it only going to apply to Teller because there was so much choreography in his trick? Or might it apply to the rest of us too? We don't know. But it appears you can patent the shtick, but not the trick. <laughs> okay. We'll go with that. Thank you, Rick. Coming up, we go undercover to buy counterfeit merchandise. Will we get caught? Have you listened to music on the internet without paying for it? Lots of people do. This upsets musicians like Taylor Swift. It freaks me out. I'll have a meltdown on the show. Still, college students download music all the time. But there's a name for what they're doing. It's called downloading songs off the internet illegally. And sometimes the music makers take action. Boston University student Joel Tannenbaum copied 30 songs and shared them on the web. The Recording Industry Association sued him, and a jury ordered him to pay $675,000. $22,500 for each song he downloaded. And that's not right, says the author of Against Intellectual Property, Stefan Kinsella. Why is it not right? The Internet has given us a tool to learn, to copy. This is what humans have been doing for thousands of years. This is how society advances and how humanity grows. Um, Copyright law basically censors free speech, it prevents people from saying what they want to say, from copying, from learning, from sharing, from remixing. Um, if, without it, people will say and mix and produce less. 
That is actually not true. Today we have piracy that's widespread, and most people don't make a dime from their works. And most people want their ideas to get out there. Um, you know, the danger to artists and to people who want to get their name out there is obscurity. It's not piracy. Piracy <laughs> is a compliment. So I should just be allowed to pirate movies off the internet? Well, I think piracy is the, the wrong term, just like the idea of the term stealing is the wrong term. When you copy information, you're not taking anything from anyone. You're copying their ideas. They still have them. Piracy is what people used to do when they would raid ships and take things. That's a good point. And the movie industry complains about digital piracy all the time. The wolf gets ripped off. The Wolf of Wall Street was downloaded illegally more than any other movie in 2014. Other films making the list include Frozen, Robocop, Gravity, and The Hobbit. Piracy, that's where Hollywood has a really big problem, and they see eye to eye with so many conservatives. Conservatives, you know, respect private property. You don't respect private property. It's true, it's not being stolen, but being copied. Well, actually, I believe in private property as a libertarian more strongly than even most conservatives. Um, and that is actually why right. I think patent law and copyrights are a bad idea. In fact, patents, That's confusing. patents expire after 17 years, roughly. Copyrights expire for after a long time later, as you noted already. Pa property rights don't expire. So it's clear that patent and copyrights are not property rights. Patents and copyrights are not property rights. Let's make this personal. I'm, frankly, sometimes happy when I see that my show is all over the Internet because my goal is to get the ideas out. It's a conflict because I also know that why would Fox pay me to do the show uh, if they didn't own it and get to make money from it? You who steal this show by watching it on places like YouTube may not think about the costs that go into making the show happen. It's not just my salary. I have seven producers who do research, book the guests, have editors who cut the video. There's a makeup person, hairstylist, the studio stage manager, the director cost of the car service that picks up the guests like you, Stefan. I, I, how, how would it happen if they couldn't own the show, protect it? Well, you certainly should uh, have the right to have, it, it, it's moral for people to give attribution credit, right? When, if, if a YouTube video is taken, there's nothing wrong with saying, hey, it's wrong for you to not tell where it came from. Copying is a different matter um, altogether. When you put information out there, you should, you should have be complimented by the fact that people are copying your show. It shows that you're popular. It shows they want to hear your ideas. The more copies that are made, the po more popular you are. Movie, movie studios make money from selling tickets. Now they can make money from selling uh, DVDs. They can sell money from rentals. On YouTube, uh, it has its own channel. They put up this warning video. Everybody's really been looking forward to the new video from Lumpy and the Lumpets. Russell's a huge fan. But YouTube warns him. Hey, Russell, you didn't create that video. You just copied someone else's content. Yar. You can be sued Ow. and found liable for monetary damages. If YouTube finds you're a repeat offender, you'll get banned for life. So, sounds like you get punished if people complain that you're stealing stuff. You will, and it's even getting worse. There, um, uh, one, one of the dangers of copyright, John, is that it's used by the state to regulate the Internet. In fact, uh, you know, the SOPA legislation was defeated a couple of years ago, which would have tried to stop piracy by imposing all kinds of surveillance on the Internet. And Internet service providers recently have agreed under government pressure to adopt this sort of six strikes and you're out rule, which is like a private, out-of-the-court system with no due process, which could get you banned from the Internet for life. Not from the internet. It yes. You banned from YouTube. No, from the internet. But has it ever happened? Not yet. But it's, these these rules are pretty new. It's a danger. So you're a patent lawyer. So I am you, a patent attorney. You're basically arguing, trying to argue yourself out of a job. Right. Just like a, a an oncologist is trying to cure cancer and put himself out of a <laughs> job, or a drug uh, an attorney who works for the ACLU or defends people against the uh, the hideous drug war is hoping to end the drug war, and he wouldn't. You know, maybe he have to find honest work then. Good for you. Thank you, Stefan. For those of you who'd like to legally watch shows of mine that maybe you missed, Fox Business does put them on the web two weeks after we, after we air. You can get to the website by going to johnstossel.com. Coming up, why it would cost me big if I sing happy birthday on this show. And next, we go undercover to try to buy some counterfeit goods. A 
of all the industries I've covered as a consumer reporter, I think one of the biggest ripoffs is fashion. This dress sells for $1,200. These shoes, $1,400. This purse is priced at $2,500. Are you kidding me? Who pays that amount of money for a purse? I can walk outside my apartment and buy a bag that looks like that for 20 bucks. And actually, this one is a high-end knockoff. It cost us $200. We got it when we went shopping with hidden cameras. Everybody watches Louis Vuitton of boots. Producer Ricky Ratliff bought that bag here in Chinatown, where people sell all kinds of counterfeit merchandise. Everything. Is it real? Yeah. Oh, please, Ray Ban, Rolex, pretty ass. Ladies, what do you need? He claimed he was selling authentic stuff. I'm going to give you all a bag of peace. Which one do you want? Some people admitted that their products weren't the real thing. It's a copy of copy, not available. We all want this to come out money. One hustler said, if we want the real quality brand name stuff, we need to follow him and meet with this woman in McDonald's. What are you looking for? Louis Vuitton. On her phone, she showed my producer a bunch of supposedly authentic $1,000 Louis Vuitton bags. It's real which she said she would sell for just $200. Where do I pay you? Cash. Later. Later. And 15 minutes later, back on the street, the bag appeared. Thank you. $200. Here's mine. Knock off Louis Vuitton. And that's how I got this. Uh, the counterfeit fashion industry is big business. Chris Sprigman knows about that. He wrote The Knockoff Economy, How Imitation sparks innovation. That makes it sound like this illegal activity is a good thing. Well, there's some good that comes out of it. Um, the presence of knockoffs democratizes fashion. It allows people in the U.S. to look good, to look stylish. Um, people who can't afford to pay $1,000 for the real Louis Vuitton bag. By the way, that's one of the cheapest Normal bags people. they sell, and that's $1,000. They sell bags that are $25,000 on the Louis Vuitton website. So knockoffs do democratize the availability of these um, items. Now. It would be bad if it hurt the branded companies, if it deprived them of customers that they would otherwise have. And I can, I can tell you that virtually nobody who buys the fake bag for $200 down on Canal Street, and that's a pretty good fake. Most fakes are cheaper than that. That's a pretty well done fake. Nobody buying those bags is going to buy the $1,000 original or the $25,000 Lux Louis Vuitton bags. So you make it's it not sound the like audience. the high priced companies are all in on the scam. They know this is going to happen. To get, but they're not getting any money from the knockoff bag. They're not getting any money from the knockoff bag, but they're not being harmed either. So the people who are in the market for the real Louis Vuitton who have all that cash to burn, they're still going to go out because they want the status that the real Louis Vuitton confers. And they want the shopping experience of the wonderful Louis Vuitton flagship store and how it pampers them. This is what they want. This is what they get. The knockoff has no discernible effect on the behavior of those folks. And those are the folks that Louis Vuitton really cares about. One blogger wrote that the cheap stores like Forever 21, Urban Outfitters, and they have knockoffs, do not allow for the creativity of the original creator to be acknowledged. I think if you look out there into the world and actually see how the fashion industry works, over the last 50 years since the end of World War II, the fashion industry in the U.S. has boomed, pretty much uninterruptedly boomed. All that time, knockoffs have been legal. So copying, actually, in the United States helps the fashion industry. It helps, for example, to signal to people that a trend has occurred. When a fashion is widely copied, it tells us there's a trend. We buy into the trend because we want to be in fashion. More information. More information for people, and so they buy into the trend. Now, when there's too much copying, it signals to people that the trend is starting to be over. It's overdone. The fashion forward among us jump off, and we jump on to the new trend that copying is starting to set. There's a fashion cycle. Copying help fuels it. So this is, a, this is good for the fashion industry. It's good for consumers. It's good for us all. Even the fashion backward like me? Well, the fashion backward benefit as well. You know, the, the, the price of clothing really hasn't gone up in the last quarter century. It stayed about the same, except for the price of clothing at the very top. That Louis Vuitton stuff, the Prada stuff, that is rocketing upward. So the rich are paying more, the rest of us are getting more for less. U.S. Customs Service, always eager to make themselves more important, uh, they say the black market for fake handbags, shoes, and purses funds other crime rings, and it's a big threat to people. 
More than a billion dollars in counterfeits are seized by Customs and Border Protection annually as federal agents crack down on what some here call the crime of the century. With the explosion of the internet right now, you can buy anything that appears to be legitimate. You think you have a, a small savings. You think you're getting the real product at a discounted price, only to find out that it's a, it's a counterfeit. The crime of the century, they call it. Well, I'm not sure it's the crime of the century, and more than that, I think it's true, just true in the world, that organized crime has its finger in every pie in which they can make money, be it legal or illegal. I think if we want to get after organized crime, we should get after organized crime. The, the counterfeiting issue is more or less a red herring. The International Chamber of Commerce claims two and a half million jobs are lost because of fake products. The International Chamber of Commerce figures on counterfeiting are worth approximately zero, and there's just no basis for them. Now, they keep repeating them as if they're a fact, and the government, unfortunately, FBI and other agencies of the government have picked them up as if they're fact. That doesn't make them true. There's a lot of good that's created. There's a lot of people in business, small business people, who are making money. And they wouldn't be otherwise. So I, I think in terms of its total economic effect, it's, it's a wash. You, you do, though, agree that if it comes to things like pharmaceutical drugs or air, airplane parts, this is a real threat. God, yes. I mean, I don't, I don't want airplanes crashing because of fake parts. I don't want people dying because of fake drugs. So we're just talking fashion, I will cosmetics. Note that, yeah, nobody ever died because of a fake handbag. And I will note that a lot of the government's efforts in this area are directed not at airplane parts and pharmaceuticals, but at handbags. Finally, Chris says another surprising way to expand your brain and think about the knockoff economy is to think about Charles Dickens. Did you read The Christmas Carol? or Great Expectations, or A Tale of Two Cities. These books have sold millions of copies, and yet, at the time, booksellers in America were not required to pay Dickens a dime. When the United States itself was a developing economy, it refused to sign treaties and had no protection for foreign creators. Charles Dickens famously complained about America's bustling book piracy market, calling it a horrible thing that scoundrel booksellers should grow rich. And yet you say he still made out. Dickens made out. When Dickens visited the United States on a lecture tour, he played to these standing room only crowds. People paid a lot of money to see him. The equivalent of millions of dollars in today's currency. Because they were able to buy cheap books, read cheap books, they wanted to go pay. And they fell in love with him. So they went to see him and at his death, a significant portion of his estate came from that trip to America. In that period, America became one of the most literate nations on earth. And it became literate in part because books were cheap. Books being cheap actually helped helped us develop to be the world power that we are today. And that, that came from the absence of copyright. Thank you, Chris Sprigman. Coming up, who owns a joke? How do comedians deal with joke stealers? And how do I deal with people who steal my brand? Welcome to 2020. I'm John Stossel. I'm John Stossel. Have you heard this joke? Why is six afraid of seven? Because seven, eight, nine. Get it? He ate nine. I didn't make that up. We all repeat jokes we've heard before. Does that make me a joke stealer? I guess so. I don't even know who thought up most of the jokes I tell. So what does this mean for professional comedians? What do they do if someone steals their jokes? Comedian Doug Stanhope says, comedians just work this out. I ask him about this because he's a libertarian. Here's a sample of his work. They say if you give a man a fish, he'll eat for a day. But if you teach a man to fish, then he's got to get a fishing license. And you couldn't even cook the fish because you needed a permit for an open flame. And then the health department is going to start asking you a lot of questions about where are you going to dump the scales and the guts. As I said, a libertarian comedian. Doug joins us now. You don't need government to protect your jokes? So, uh, yeah, no, no. Uh, comedy's a, a really good uh, self-policing art form. If you go to an open mic and you want to try to get into this business, if you're stealing someone's jokes, you are going to be outed and, and publicly shamed and uh, run out of town. And, and yet Robin Williams was known as a joke stealer. Huge, yeah, yeah. Milton Berle and Robin Williams are probably the two legendary. They weren't run joke out of thieves. town. 
No, there's the, there's the anomaly that slipped through the cracks. Uh, there's legendary stories from the comedy store in L.A. about Robin Williams coming into the showroom and someone would put him up against the wall by the throat and his manager would write a check uh, for, for stealing jokes. Uh, but yeah, there's very few that get through and, and they're labeled. Uh, people wouldn't go on stage when Robin Williams was in the room after, after he got branded with that scarlet letter of joke thief. In 2006, comedian Dane Cook was accused of stealing jokes from comedian Louis C.K. And Louis kindly invited Cook on Louis's TV show to joke about it. Here's Cook first. 2006 was the greatest year of my entire life. I had a double platinum comedy album. First one ever to exist. That should have been like my triumph. And I enjoyed it, Louis, for maybe two months. Two months before it started to suck because everything I read about me was about how I stole jokes from you, which I didn't. I kind of think you did. So Louis C.K. has him on his own show? Yeah, no, Louis C.K. Is a, is a gentleman, and he's always been above the fray in these things. A lot of people did gang up on Dane Cook on that one, and, uh, and Louis handled it uh, like a sportsman. He didn't, uh, he didn't antagonize it, he didn't fan the flames, but, uh, and when he did have Dane Cook on that show, I thought it was brilliant on both sides. Some comedians do lose work because they're accused of stealing jokes. Joe, Joe Rogan went on stage to interrupt a routine by Carlos <laughs> Mencia and accused Mencia of yes. stealing jokes from many other comedians. He had to end the show by saying Carlos Mencia stealing. If someone steals a riff from a song, that's the news constantly. It's easy to say you steal I could say you steal, but I don't. Mencia found it tougher to get work after that? That uh, pretty much destroyed him. Mencia was on the top of his game at that point. He was at a Comedy Central show. He was selling out theaters all over the country. And almost immediately after that went viral, it, it, it destroyed his career. He, it brought him down to my level. That's <laughs> how, how bad. If I'm doing the Wednesday, he's doing the Thursday at the same rotten, rotten club. Well, thank you, Doug Stanhope. We'll now raise you up to higher levels. Coming up, have you brushed your teeth with crust toothpaste? Do you use arm and hatchet baking soda? Do you buy coffee at Sunbucks coffee shops? I'll explain when we come back. Happy birthday to you, hap. I can't sing the rest of the song. If I did, it would cost Fox lots of money because the rights to happy birthday are owned by Warner Music. Sheesh, they bought the rights in 1998 and now people pay them about $2 million a year to use the song in movies and TV shows. Intellectual property laws have teeth one guy thinks he can get around the law by changing small things. He made this YouTube clip, which has been watched half a million times. Happy birthday to you. Cute, but lawyers tell me that probably does not make this video legal. One thing, though, that does make copying legal is parody. If you take someone's work but change it to make a joke about it, that's not a copyright violation. And that's good for intellectual freedom. But not such a good thing for people like me, because people make videos like these. Welcome to 2020. I'm John Stossel. I'm John Stossel. Give me a break. You want a break? You're going to get a break. I'm going to give you a break right now. I'm going to kick you Stupid, and there's nothing I can do about that. And there's practically nothing any of us can do about intellectual property violations in other countries. In China, lots of merchants copy, or should I say steal and mangle, recognizable American brands. Uh, they think it'll give their products credibility, so various stores will sell you Sunbucks coffee, Tid's laundry soap, something called Unbelievable, this is not butter, Arm and Hatchet baking soda. And if you're hungry for fast food, you can get King Burger or this takeoff on Kentucky Fried Chicken. But instead of the colonel, President Obama apparently fries the birds. And after you've done all that eating, you can brush your teeth with 
crushed toothpaste. That's what happens in China. In America, Thomas Jefferson once opposed copyright laws. Ideas are like candlelight, he wrote. He who receives an idea from me receives instruction himself without lessening mine. He receives light without darkening me. It's a good point. Jefferson later backed off that a bit. He said he just opposed the old English standard, which was ownership forever. And he did support very limited ownership of ideas, maybe 14 years. I don't know where the line should be, but when ideas are free, creativity blossoms. I like how journalist Matt Ridley put it, that ideas have sex with each other and then they give birth to new, often better ideas. That helps us all. Some libertarians on my show tonight said it would be better if America had no copyright or trademark protection, and they made some good points, but I have to wonder, would I have written these books if publishers hadn't offered me money? I doubt it. They gave me money only because they knew that no one was allowed to just copy the book. I also assume I get paid by Fox only because you cable subscribers and advertisers pay for this program. Maybe I do this for nothing. I like doing it. Maybe. But I wouldn't work as hard and I'd balk at paying for the cameras and all the expensive things that go into making TV. So I'm glad we have some intellectual property laws. That's our show. See you next week.